Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, the 19th of September, 2023. It's good to have you on board, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by Textron Systems' Aerosond Uncrewed Aircraft System, designed for expeditionary land and sea-based operations, building on the system 600,000-plus flight hours in the field, the hybrid quad variant offers, offers vertical takeoff and landing capability and brings enhanced mission flexibility while maintaining a small footprint. Learn more at textronsystems.com. Okay, my guest today is Major General Greg Martin, U.S. Army retired. He is the author of a new book from the Naval Institute Press titled Bipolar General, My Forever War with Mental Illness. General Martin, it's great to have you back on the show. Congrats on the book. Thanks, Bill. It's great to be back with you. So you were on the show a, a little over a year ago, August of last year, and uh, that was episode number 281 for listeners who want to go back to it. And that episode was based on a proceedings article you've written for us. And so some of our listeners have heard parts of your story before, but now the book is out. So I'd like to go a little bit deeper today. Um, so let's just start with a recap of your story, which is just a, a, an incredible, compelling story. So you're a West Point graduate, class of 1979, combat engineer by MOS. You commanded a battalion. Uh, you have a PhD from MIT. You're a brigade commander in Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom. You're so selected for brigadier general, then major general. You became the president of the National Defense University in 2014, and then the wheels came off. What happened, sir? Well, when I got uh, given the ultimatum, resign or you're fired at NDU in July of 2014, that was really the culmination of pretty much a lifetime of living on the bipolar spectrum. Uh, since and I, I've put I've come to understand a lot of my condition and what happened since writing the book and working with some expert psychiatrists who have really dug deep. So basically, from the time I was a teenager on, I had a condition known as hyperthymia, which is a near continuous level of mild mania, which gives you a boost and advantage in the in the form of extra energy, enthusiasm, drive, creativity, and so forth. And so it. This living on the bipolar spectrum and having a bipolar brain really gave me an advantage for decades, all through high school at West Point, Ranger School, uh, as an officer in the Army, you know, top ratings, ran seven marathons in a couple of year period, under three hours. Um, and so it was really to my advantage, lifting and boosting all my natural talents until it actually elevated into an, uh, a bipolar onset, which happened in 2003 in the Iraq war when I was a brigade commander leading thousands of troops. The intense thrill, ecstasy, stress, trauma of being in combat essentially triggered the genetic predisposition for bipolar disorder. And that was in two, 2013 when I was a colonel. It was unknown, unrecognized, undiagnosed. Nobody knew I had bipolar disorder, including myself. Over the next 11 years, my manic highs started going higher and higher. My depressive lows started going lower and lower. I, I basically developed psychosis, which is hallucinations and delusions. And it, it started get it, it probably got to the tipping point when I was at National Defense University, where I went really out of control into a state of madness, insanity, um, you know, over the edge completely. And in the spring and summer of 2014, uh, I had become so bad that um, lots of students, administration and faculty said, wow, there's something wrong with General Martin. Uh, we don't know what, but we need to report this. And so people started doing anonymous reports up the chain of command to the chairman's office and the joint staff. And uh, basically, if you, if you read those letters, they read like coming out of a textbook of bipolar illness, like right out of the psychiatry textbooks. That's what I was demonstrating. But nobody around me could identify the signs. They just knew I was acting weird and strange and over the top. 
But the uh, the chairman decided to do an assessment, an investigation, figure out what's going on at NDU. And he came to the conclusion that I needed to go. And I'm really grateful for that, because if I had stayed at NDU longer, I think it would have, you know, had created harm to the to the school and it could have killed me. Um, you know, with the, you know, all of the, the biochemical things going on with bipolar, I could easily have had a, a, a heart attack, a stroke, a nervous breakdown, what have you. So it was uh, July 2014, got a call, report to the chairman's office on Monday morning at 10. And Bill, I was so high, so manic that I didn't know if I was going to get fired, if I was going to get promoted to three-star and revert the position back to the, the three-star position it had always been, or if he was going to extend me in command for another couple of years, which I had requested, I really didn't know. But when I went in his office, the first person I saw was the lawyer. I said, whoa, no promotion today. Because I knew, that, <laughs> okay, this is not going to be a good day. And the chairman, who I had worked for four or five times and was really had a great relationship with, uh, he came across the office, he gave me a big hug, and he said, Greg, I love you like a brother. You've done an amazing job. I, would, I give you a rating of A plus as president of NDU. But your time at NDU is over. You have until 5 p.m. today to resign or I will fire you. And oh, by the way, I'm giving you an order this week to get a psychiatric evaluation at Walter Reed. What are your questions? And you would think I would have been disappointed, you know, dejected. I was so manic and so unbelievably high, you know, flying through space that I said, thank you, sir. This is wonderful because God put me into NDU to do great things. And now he's going to put me somewhere else to do even greater things. And I, I walked out of there, you know, like 10 feet off the ground. I was so happy, um, which is not unusual when someone's in a state of mania. And, you know, and by the way, there were people who were giving me hints and indications they thought I was losing it. But in a state of mania, you don't believe them. You, you feel like Superman. I thought I was the smartest person in the world. So none of it made any difference to me. And I'll, I'll hold there because the story gets a lot worse from there. Well, I, I remember, sir. In fact, you know, on my wall behind me is a master's degree from NDU and it's signed by you. You were the president of NDU at the time and you came in. So I graduated in 2013. You'd been uh, the president just for a few months. And I remember, and, and all the students remember when you took over in that, I think it was the spring of, of 2013, um, you brought this incredible energy to the school. And you, you know, there were uh, sort of all hands calls and you spoke to the student body and you, you know, we were like, wow, this guy, he's like Superman. He's got a PhD from MIT. He's, you know, brigade commander. He's brings all this energy to this. He's got both academic and operational you know, it was it was an exciting time to be a student there. Um, and uh, and then, you know, a, a year later, when you were relieved, all of us who were former students of yours, you know, we were like, what happened? You know, and it, it took a while for this story to come out. Um, but I, I want to let me just uh, go to the, the next uh, couple of questions here. So it took a while. So, General, you mentioned General General Dempsey said, hey, you, you've got to get a, a, a mental health checkup, essentially, right? And um, so you did, and that's in the book. You, you, know, you mentioned that you went and you got a mental health checkup, but you were not diagnosed as being bipolar. It took a while for you to actually get the final diagnosis that helped you. So talk about that process, if you will, for a minute. Sure. Um, so it, when when I was in Iraq, I was mostly in a state of mania, and that's when the onset was. And I felt great. I mean, I had so much energy and enthusiasm, felt phenomenal. Um, when I came home from Iraq, I, I sunk into a 10-month-long serious depression. And that happened again a couple more times prior to NDU. In each, so three different times when I had depression, I went to the doctors and said, hey, doctor, there's something wrong with me. I'm depressed. I have no energy. I don't want to be around people. I'm indecisive. I'm confused. There's something going on in my brain. And normally I'm full of energy. My mind it works very rapidly and you know, great at solving problems. And three different times over those years, uh, the doctor said, no, there's nothing wrong with you. And they were looking at a guy who had serious bipolar disorder and was in a state of depression. 
so fast forward to 2014, after General Dempsey removed me from command, I went into Walter Reed and I met with them. And for psychiatric eval, you pretty much sit in an office and have a conversation. And I felt fine and everything seemed fine. And so the doctors looked at me and they said, you know, we don't see anything wrong with this guy. You know, they're, and, and part of it is they're, the, my success in being a general officer masked the fact that I had an underlying bipolar condition. So they couldn't see past the two stars and the fact that I was president of NDU or I was president of NDU. <laughs> and, uh, and so they made a bad uh, diagnosis. They got it completely wrong. The, and they did. And I went back. When, when I, we sent that um, finding, fit for duty, totally healthy, up to the chairman's office, he said, redo, do another one. And so I did two more psychiatric evaluations, and all three of them said, this guy's good to go, including one from the head of psychiatry at Walter Reed. It's, it's on the form. He said, uh, General Martin is the most emotionally healthy officer I've ever met in my career. And I'm sitting wow. there intensely manic. Um, now, why did they get it so wrong? Uh, I think it's because they didn't have a good conversation with General Dempsey and his people. I think that if the info that the chairman had that led him to remove me, if they had gotten that and read it and had a conversation, I think they could have diagnosed me pretty quickly because it was like a textbook case of bipolar disorder. But what happened was, I, in, th there's a couple bad things that came out of that. I had paranoid delusions that people were out to get me, to get me fired, to get me put in jail, et cetera, um, because they were writing articles to uh, Tom Ricks and, and saying, you know, the bad things about me. And um, so I already had this paranoid delusion about my people. And then I said, see, that's proof. They, they were out to get me because there is nothing wrong with me at all. And then I went into a state of anger, bitterness, rage against the people that I thought had plotted against me to get me fired. Um, because they, they had got me fired by sending those anonymous complaints. But then I, I, I started to spiral and then I crashed into terrible depression, worst I'd ever had in my life. And by November, the depression was so bad, I could barely function as a, as a human being. And, you know, all those chemicals, dopamine, endorphins that created this mania, they basically dried up and went away and plunged me into depression. And so I went back to Walter Reed to the same doctor and I said, hey, doctor, there is something seriously wrong with my brain. I am really sick. I'm barely functioning as a person. And then they were able to connect some dots, do a little more research. And they said, aha, you have bipolar disorder with psychosis. And so that was a, that was a big step forward that I got a proper diagnosis. But that entered me into uh, two years of what I call bipolar hell of hopeless depression, uh, terrifying psychosis, and just really scraping along at the bottom of, of hell. Uh, and that went for two years. Well, you were finally diagnosed at Walter Reed. Uh, on your third diagnosis, and you're still active duty, you're still in the army at that point. So you'd been fired from NDU, but you hadn't retired yet. Um, the, did it just, they didn't get the, the medication correct? What, what, why did you still descend down into that, you know, bipolar hell, as you describe it in the book? Um, well, first off, it's, it's diagnosing bipolar disorder is pretty tricky, and it, it's, it's not easy to do correctly and it often takes a number of years to actually diagnose correctly. But then once they di diagnose you with bipolar disorder, you know, there's over a dozen different kinds of medication that they mm. can try. And they tried about a dozen on me and all they did was make me groggy and fall asleep. They didn't do anything to contain the bipolar disorder. Um, it wasn't until almost two years later through the VA that we tried um, lithium, which is a natural occurring salt in the earth to, on the chemical periodical tables. But lithium, after having been depressed and psychotic for two years, within three days my, of taking lithium, my depression lifted, the psychosis vanished, and I began my path to recovery. And that was seven years ago. Wow. So uh, you, by that time, I guess you had gone through the retirement process. You'd moved from the D.C. area up to New Hampshire, Vermont, and that was a VA hospital 
uh, up there in White River Junction, Vermont. I've been by that hospital a number of times as my uh, oldest daughter was at Dartmouth for a few years and I uh, used to go visit up there. Um, so a, a lot of veterans and soon to be veterans will navigate that VA Veterans Administration Health System. H how did that go for you? And what advice do you have for both the system and for service members trying to get the help that they need? So how, how did how did that, you know, we, we hear a lot about navigating the VA health system. How did it go for you? Mixed. Um, when I left the military, there was no continuity of care plan. And DOD has fixed that. So I basically kind of got tossed out there into the civilian health care system, no connection to the VA or anyone. And, and that was that was really a bad thing. Um, and I was afraid to go to the VA because I had this powerful delusion that that I had I was being watched and spied on and that there was a conspiracy out to get me arrested and put in jail. So I was afraid that if I went to the VA, which is a federal installation, that they would see me and say, ah, we've been looking for this guy and arrest me. And of course, this makes zero sense, but it's a delusion. And when you have psychosis, you believe things to be true that are in fact not true. Or with a hallucination, you see, hear, and feel things to be real that are not real. And so I was in this terrible delusion. So I resisted going to the VA until I just got worse and worse and worse. and was just in a, a terrible state of what they call passive suicidal ideations, where I was envisioning my own death over and over again. And so a friend of mine, kind of a battle buddy from the army who had been a, a medical corps person, he, um, he said, Greg, we, we have to do something. He, he actually worked through my wife, Maggie, because I wasn't listening to him, wasn't listening to anybody, wasn't responding to texts or emails. So through Maggie, my wife, he did some research and he found out that the White River Junction VA had an excellent psychiatry department, really top notch. And so he said, we got to get you up there. And so I, he was able to kind of grease the skids and get me to talk to the head of psychiatry, get an appointment. Once I went in there and the head doctor met me, he said, whoa, you're in really bad shape, especially with the, um, the, the suicidal ideations. And he said, we need to keep you here for a while. And so I did two weeks of inpatient care, which was excellent. It was so good, the multidisciplinary um, uh, approach. Uh, and they tried all kinds of therapies, including electric shock therapy, uh, which didn't do anything for me, unfortunately. Um, but the VA at White River Junction was really good, very professional, very um, compassionate, super, really knew what they were doing. And, and then once we got to Florida, I got into the local VA here. I would tell people, give the VA a chance. They're well-resourced. They have a tremendously professional staff. They're very, very good when it comes to um, mental issues in war-related things such as PTSD, traumatic brain injury, depression, bipolar disorder, moral injury, survivor's guilt. They're, I, I think they're probably as good as anybody in the, in the country when it comes to those kind of things. So I would encourage veterans um, when you get out of the military, well, before you get out, do all the thing with a veteran service officer, like from the VFW or somewhere, and take your military medical records and get them translated into VA speak, and then get your get your um, your disability paperwork working, and then get enrolled in the VA, get an ID card, try to try to get stuff set up there, and if you don't like the treatment you're getting, ask for a different doctor. Say, hey, I'm not. It's not working well with this doctor. Can I get a different one? You can get a, you can get a counselor that'll help you navigate. Um, if you don't like some of the findings and determinations they make, challenge them and make them go back and relook at it. I, I would say my treatment with the VA, especially with you know mental health stuff, has been been good. I would give the uh, Vermont, I'd give them an A plus, and you know not quite that high down here. Gotcha. Well, that's good to hear. And I, one of the things that I, I heard you say, it sounded like, uh, you know, you have to sort of uh, make sure that there's a continuity as you leave active duty and, and get yourself into whatever care system follows after that, if it's the VA. Uh, and then also you got to be, you have to give them a chance, but also sort of push them on right. the diagnosis and on the, 
you know, their decisions about your disability levels and all those kinds of things. Gotcha. It also sounds like you had a good battle buddy, which is uh, another key thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to ask a couple of questions that might benefit people who work with and for people who are suffering from, from a mental health crisis. So your staff at NDU raised some alarms about you. Um, is there a process to do that? Uh, and, and do you have any advice for people who see alarming behavior in a colleague or in, you know, a fellow sailor, soldier, airman, Marine? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll kind of approach it from the perspective of, you know, what my experience was and what could have been done differently that could have led to maybe a better outcome. Um, first off, the entire DOD, the entire society needs to do a better job at educating on mental illness, um, you know, because it's so prevalent. 20% of the world population are afflicted with a mental illness and the other 80% are affected by virtue of being family, friend, or work colleague. So, I mean, everybody is touched by mental illness. It's not something that's unusual. Um, so we need to teach it and train it like we do first aid. Or we should approach it like physical fitness, you know, mental health is health. It should be on the same par as physical fitness training and, and awareness and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's that's probably number one. But down at the at the at all levels, people should know what are the basic symptoms of the most common mental illnesses. You know, what does it look? What what? How does PTSD, depression, bipolar disorder, TBI? How do they manifest themselves? What are the signals? And if everybody's trained on it. And then they, everybody has a battle buddy. Like I was lucky to have Bill Barco, who was my battle buddy. Um, then the battle buddy has your know, peer support is what they call it in the civilian world. They have the responsibility to give the news, to tell the news like it is, you know, no, no sugar coating, tell it like it is and have the difficult conversation without any fear of retribution uh, from anybody and get the person in to get some kind of help. Now, in my case, I didn't have a battle buddy other than my wife um, who didn't see me at work where I was craziest. Um, I mean, I really mm -hmm. wasn't that bad at home, but at work I was, I was gonzo. And, um, but if people had come to me as a few folks did, I would have dismissed it because I was in mania and would have said, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm on a mission from God. I'm on a mission from the chairman of the joint chiefs. I'm doing, I'm, this, I'm super smart. I'm, I'm just so far above you. You can't understand what I'm seeing and thinking. So I would have not, it wouldn't have really made any impact on me because I thought I was Superman and held the key to world peace. Um, but what, what you need though, is somebody that, that we're seeing, people that we're seeing problems, they, they needed a safe channel. Like it's probably too much to expect a private or a young sailor to say, hey, I'm going to go talk to the two star and tell him I think he's nuts. That's not going to happen. Right. But a two star is surrounded by very high ranking people who have nothing to fear in coming in to see him. Like I had, you know, a handful of other general officers. I had a handful of SESs. I had a handful of ambassadors that all worked around me. And so if someone really was concerned, they could have gone to the ambassador or the other general or the SES and said, hey, I'm really worried about General Martin. He, he looks like he's going nuts. I mean, he's crazy. And, uh, and here's what we're seeing. And then if that happened, I would expect any of those high ranking people to have the intestinal fortitude, which is still it takes a little bit of courage to come into the boss and say, hey, you know, I'm getting all these reports that you're really having problems. But that's what I think should happen. Um, but, you know, the system actually in its own way worked. People saw a serious problem with Greg Martin. They didn't know how to handle it. So they wrote notes and letters to my boss. And the boss got, I mean, he got a complete picture. And he got the information he needed to be very concerned, to launch an investigation and make what for him, I'm sure, was a, kind of a tough decision because he really liked me. He picked me for the job and then he fired me from the job. I'm sure he didn't want to get rid of me, sure. but he had. To, and he probably he may very well have saved my life, my family, my marriage. Um, and so, you know, in a way it worked.
Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, what I heard from that is, you know, it, it's it's a bit of the if you see something, say something. Right. You know, we all we owe it to our fellow, you know, our shipmates, as we say in the Navy. Um, you know, if you see somebody who's just normally behaves uh, professionally, is smart and is wise and, and you know, all those things and suddenly they're not, um, you got to say something either to them and or uh, to their bosses uh, to get them the, the help that they need. Yeah. And then, you know, that, that applies across from, you know, junior enlisted people all the way up to general officers and flag officers. Yeah. Um, so you dedicate a section of the book to observations by those who are closest to you, to your family. Uh, and I was struck by the fact, and you mentioned it a minute ago about your wife, um, that it took a while for your wife and your sons to see that something was very wrong in your behavior. Um, do you have any insights about why it was so hard for them to see the problem? Yes. And it's pretty much the same reason why it took everybody else that I work with and my friends a long time to see the problem. I mean, there's, there's really a, a couple different factors. One, my whole life, I was in this hyperthymic state of high energy, high enthusiasm, lots of drive. And that crept its way upward gradually over many years and decades. And so the changes in me were virtually imperceptible if you were around me a lot. So my friends didn't really see any difference. They just said, hey, it's Greg, you know, high energy, you know, party guy, loves to have fun. It's really funny, um, you know, tons of enthusiasm. And so they never saw it. Um, the work people they really didn't see it either because my success masked the odd behavior. So if, if somebody saw me um, in 2000, say, they would have said, whoa, high energy. This guy, you know, he's doing well. But they saw me in 2010, 10 years later, they'd say, whoa, he has really changed. There's something very odd about this. He's not the same person. He's acting way over the top. But nobody in the military stays with you for that period. There's, there's no continuity. You right. do a job for two years, you're out the door, you go somewhere else, new people. And so people kept seeing me, but in, and all they would know is, hey, we heard General Martin was super enthusiastic and now we see him and yeah, he is super enthusiastic and they don't see any alarm bells. Um, and, and you asked specifically about the family. And so my whole life, I was high energy, and it, and it, so they didn't see any substantive change until about the spring and summer of 2014, which is about the time I got fired. Um, you know, so they would just see me and say, well, you know, he is super energetic, but he's always been that way. Oh, he's, you know, he's got um, all this drive and enthusiasm, but, you know, he's always been that way. And as my wife Maggie described it, um, you know, she feels like she was a frog in a pot of water that she's in the water. I, and, I read that. Yeah. And that's a great analogy. Suddenly the water started boiling about the time that I got fired. And as I said earlier, Maggie didn't see me at work where I was, you know, pretty, pretty much in a state of insanity. Um, and then when I was home, I wasn't that bad. And then I couldn't sleep. I went about three months with virtually no sleep when I was in full blown mania. And I would go out at night and ride my bike all over Washington, D.C., go out on long power walks. And so she'd be, a, a, you know, in bed asleep and I'd be out, you know, roaming around the streets of Washington, D.C. like a, you know, a crazy man. Uh, amazing. I mean, and, um, your, your son, I remember one of the, one of your sons, you know, mentioned that aura effect, right. Of, of always holding you in this high regard and seeing you from early on as a person who had this incredible energy, sort of a super human. And then, and so that, that didn't change. And it, it took a long time for that aura to sort of unmask what, what was really coming to the fore in, in 2014. Uh, yeah, I was very, Glad to see that you included those sort of one or two page descriptions from the, you know, your family members and, you know, gave them a, gave them a chance to write about what they were observing, you know, in your life. That was uh, you know, quite insightful. Um, we don't have time for the whole list of recommendations that you have at the end of the book, but in chapter 15, you do have several recommendations for what the military 
and individuals can do to improve mental health. So just if you would share a couple of those with our audience, that would be great, sir. Sure. Uh, the military as a whole, I've touched on that a little bit. Um, you know, better education, better training, so people know what the symptoms are. They can take action. A buddy, a, a battle buddy system where people can talk frankly to each other. Uh, access to mental health care pushed down to the lowest, you know, level, as close to the deck plate as you can get. So it's there for people. Um, and then, um, you know, and I think the military has actually improved quite a bit in this regard. You know, not a one size fits all or automatic decision that we're going to med board this person out of the military because of a mental condition. And I think we're actually doing well if you look back 20 years. I mean, there's lots of people serving with PTSD, with depression, with traumatic brain injuries, moral injuries, survivor's guilt, even with bipolar disorder, but the type two variety, which does not include these, um, these swings into very high mania like I did. Like I, people like me would be uh, discharged from the military because bipolar type one with the risk of mania is just in the military's eyes, too dangerous with, you know, the things we have going on and weapons and classified info. And um, so I, I think that if you, people can look at mental health issues and say, you know, uh, you know, this sailor is going to go get a mental health exam, they shouldn't stigmatize that any more than they would somebody getting uh, looked at for an injured knee or an injured back. And just think about it, that it's a physiologically real illness or condition inside the wiring of the brain. And you, you can't see it because it's inside the brain, but it's, it's very real, just like diabetes or cancer or heart disease. And you know the, the thing people need to realize is it touches everybody. And if it's not taken care of, it can lead to ruined marriages, families, careers, um, you know, homelessness, addictions, prison, and death. That's the bad news. The good news is, and this is where I'll switch into the individual part, the very, very good news about mental illness and mental health is that if the person goes in and gets treated and gets a proper diagnosis and gets on a, the right medical regimen and gets the right medication and they work with their doctors and their therapist and they live a healthy life with, you know, diet, nutrition, sleep, exercise and all that stuff. And then they do smart things in their life. Like I call them the five P's, you know, be around people who are energized and happy and fun to be with, have a purpose in your life. Like my purpose and mission is sharing my bipolar story to save lives and stop the stigma live in a place that makes you happy and energized. It's like my place now is Cocoa Beach, Florida. It's fun, it's happy, it's bright. Um, and then you have to have fourth P is perseverance. You, have, you can't give up because this journey of mental health has setbacks along the way and you have to fight your way through it and keep going. And then lastly, the last P is the fifth is presence. The idea of presence is thinking about your own thinking. A fancy word is metacognition, because a lot of times what we're thinking inside our own minds is incorrect. It steers us the wrong way. So if you can get outside of your own head and think objectively and work with other people about the stuff you're thinking, you can, you can have a much clearer picture um, and, on how to go forward. And then I guess the last thing I would say is hope. You, you know, when I was in the two years of mental hell, I, I had no hope. I thought I was going to die. I wished I would die. I thought my wife and family would be better off if I was dead. And so I was I had lost hope. And it was really just through my wife and my battle buddy, Bill Barco, and, and a couple others that they were able to kindle this idea of hope. And then when I did the inpatient thing at the, the VA, that really brought hope alive. And then, you know, I started taking lithium, hope came alive. And I've had really a wonderful life for the last seven years of, you know, basically journey of recovery, uh, new life, lo loving it. And uh, so that message is hope. Don't ever give up. There's always hope. Go find people that can nourish that hope. Can't think of a better way to end it, sir. Uh, my guest is retired Army Major General Greg Martin. His book just published by the Naval Institute Press is titled Bipolar General, My Forever War with Mental Illness. 
sir, uh, thanks for your time. It's great, great to have you on the show. And uh, thanks for being so articulate about such an important topic, such a, uh, such, you know, one, as you said, it, it touches, really, it touches just about everybody. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, my pleasure, Bill, and keep up the great work you're doing. All right, sir. Well, we will uh, look forward to when we hear from you next. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Textron Systems, Aerosond uncrewed air aircraft system designed for expeditionary land and sea-based operations, building on the system's 600,000 plus flight hours in the field. The hybrid quad variant offers vertical takeoff and landing capability and brings enhanced mission flexibility while maintaining a small footprint. Learn more at textronsystems.com. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute. Thank you.